Hello everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity to meet you all today and to present a very personal perspective on the challenges of bringing molecular classification of endometrial cancer into diagnostic practice. Um, my purpose is twofold to, to introduce myself to you and to also pay tribute to the amazing teams, including the team here that have done so much um, to uh, help introduce this classification in, into gynecological um, diagnostic practice. I won't be talking about every single te team who has done a lot, but just the, um, the teams I've been involved with, the individuals I've worked with, as I say, it's a very personal perspective. Um, and I'll explain what the electro journey is that relates to this personal journey. Here we go. Okay, my slides uh, don't want to advance. Okay, so we know that endometrial carcinoma, I don't need to tell the group here, is a, is a cancer of the epithelial cells from the lining of the endometrium. And having uh, started in the endometrium, it then proceeds to uh, grow to different stages. So stage one is when it's confined to the endometrium, but uh, based on how much it invades the myometrium or the smooth muscle wall of the uterus. Stage two is when it involves the cervix. Stage three is when it involves either the peritoneal surface or the adnexa or the vagina or the parametrium or the lymph nodes. And stage four is distant spread. And depending on how far it is advanced at the time that we make a diagnosis, um, like any other cancer, the survival of the patient is dependent on that. And thankfully, um, maybe uh, three quarters or between two thirds and three quarters present at stage one. So the overall survival of this cancer is quite good. But the epidemiology is frightening. This is already the commonest gynecological cancer in high income countries, and its rising uh, uh, incidence is in epidemic proportions, largely related to obesity, but also other factors. The highest rate of increase is in North America, but the increase is global, and there's a very worrying trend to poorer outcomes in uh, low socioeconomic status and uh, low income countries. The incidence has increased across all groups, but the incidence in young women has doubled. Uh, the mortality rates have fallen, but the absolute number of cancer-related deaths is higher. And all of that epidemiology can be summarized in one sentence, which is that more and more women each year are both dying from this disease as well as surviving this cancer. So for anybody who's uh, involved in the care of patients with endometrial cancer, it's important for us to look at ways to stop women from dying as well as improve the quality of life of those who do not succumb to this disease. So how do we do this? I said that uh, stage of course is important, but that's not the only parameter we look at. We also have traditionally divided endometrial cancers into two types. The, the type one uh, are the low-grade endometrioid cancers, and these uh, have the traditional risk factors such as obesity, anything that causes an increase in estrogen exposure. The type two cancers are the minority, but they are the more aggressive. Uh, they are high risk almost by definition, and the risk factors for these are not as well understood. And so this is the sort of way in which we put all of those parameters, so stage features in there, the low-grade endometrioid features in there, and the other factor that we look at is the extent of vascular invasion, that is the presence of tumor within uh, lymphatic and blood vessel spaces, that is a risk factor for distant spread. So for an endometrioid cancer, all of those parameters are taken into account and the, the, the risk is uh, defined accordingly. And similarly for non-endometrioid, which for the vast majority are high risk by definition. And depending on the risk group a patient falls into, she is given um, additional treatment. So pretty much everybody has surgery as the starting treatment. And if a patient falls into the low risk category, there's nothing further to be done, discharge, and that's all uh, the treatment she needs. And most women are cured with this. But as we go up the risk groups, the 
adjuvant treatment options change. So we start with radiotherapy and that at the lowest end is vaginal brachytherapy, very, very localized with very few side effects. But as we go higher, you need external beam radiation, which can uh, cause damage and therefore toxicity, further toxicity, because more tissues are exposed when these rays are um, uh, you know, given externally, and then chemotherapy for the highest risk cases. But we've known for a long time that this uh, classification is not so great because there are some uh, cancers that do not fall into one of these two categories very neatly, and they can be both. Uh, they can be all sorts of reasons for this. It can either be that a cancer looks as if it's high risk, but then uh, the behavior does not uh, bear out because the outcome is exceptionally good, or they can be the other way around that they look as if they're low risk, but the um, outcomes uh, belie that in that they behave much more aggressively. So I've got a line on my presentation and we saw what happened a few weeks ago. I'm, I'm hoping that this is an error of some sort, but let's all be prepared. Um, what we have though, uh, what the Cancer Genome Atlas has shown uh, now some eight years ago is that these cancers don't fall into two groups, they fall in fact into four groups. And when we, before we look at the definitions of those four groups, we just go back into some high school biology. We know that a cell, when it needs to divide, it needs to replicate its entire DNA make it uh, an exact copy. So it has two identical DNA molecules, one for each of the cells. And in order for that to happen, there are, uh, you know, without any errors, obviously that is essential for the survival of the daughter cells, that each of the cells inherits an exact copy of the parent DNA. For that to happen, there are many, many processes in the cell that make sure that there are no errors. So here's that DNA strand, it has been unwound, and the, uh, a, a second strand is being synthesized adjacent to it. And here is depicted an enzyme called DNA polymerase epsilon. The function of this enzyme is to firstly make sure that the correct nucleotide is added at each position. So it's, it's choosing the right bead. And secondly, it has a second part of the molecule known as the exonuclease domain that proofreads this newly synthesized strand and makes sure that the correct nucleotides have in fact been inserted. Now, once Pol E, this enzyme uh, polymerase epsilon is abbreviated as Pol E, once it's finished its function, there's a second set of um, correcting, uh, you know, of, of safeguarding that comes into play, which is the mismatch repair system. And this looks at uh, further at any mismatches. Now, most of the time, the, the uh, Base, base mismatches are very well picked up by exonuclease domain, but the indel uh, errors that are um, numerical errors where there is an, uh, when, the, when there are repetitive strands in the DNA, a single nucleotide repeated many times or a pair or anything up to six nucleotides repeated many times. These, these sections of DNA are known as microsatellites. There can be numerical errors which can be missed by exonuclease uh, DNA polymerase exonuclease domain, and MMR is um, particularly good at that, at those mismatches. It, as the name suggests, it detects the mismatches and repairs them. So these two mechanisms can be defective in the causation of endometrial cancer, and that's what gives rise to our four groups. So in the poly mutated group, there is a, a defect, usually in the exonuclease domain of polymerase epsilon, and that results in huge numbers of mutations every time the cancer cell divides. Second in line is the mismatch repair defective or microsatellite unstable. Again, if that system is defective, then there are large numbers of mutations, tenfold more than if there, are, there is no mismatch repair defect. And these tend to be in the, these microsatellites. They tend to be in their errors in microsatellites. And then we are left with the two that we used to define previously, the, the, these um, copy number low or endometrioid carcinomas, which, which uh, do not show 
large numbers of mutations or somatic copy number abnormalities. And the fourth group with the worst outcome that shows huge numbers, not, not so many single mutations, but lots and lots of structural changes uh, defined by TCGA as copy number high. And the whole point of this separation is that it is prognostic. It separates these four groups of tumors, uh, separates endometrial cancers into four groups that have completely different prognosis. Now, the TCGA used a very um, elegant, expensive set of assays, which were uh, wonderful, comprehensive, gave us a lot of information, but there's no way that we can do that in routine practice. So how on earth were we going to do that? So here's my first tribute to this team in Vancouver and led by uh, Aileen Talhook, who in two short years after the publication of the TCGA produced this paper, which demonstrated how this um, very complex system could be replicated in uh, routine practice. So not just Aileen, but of course the whole team there. And what they did in that project, which you, you well know is, um, looked at surrogates for each of the groups and tested them in different combinations. I think in all 16 or 18 different algorithms were tested to see firstly whether they replicated the prognostic information exactly like TCGA. And uh, in addition to that, how, how expensive were they? How accessible were they? Could these be replicated into routine practice? And having put that forward, they then went ahead and validated it in two separate cohorts, uh, clearly demonstrating its applicability. And that has been replicated many times in other series. And it's um, great that the current WHO, which was published in 2020, has this algorithm with very minor changes from the original that was introduced in the BJC article in 2015. And uh, this has been recommended for routine clinical practice, uh, which is wonderful. And uh, the um, tests that you need to do this are immunohistochemistry for mismatch repair, which is something very easy. We can stay in a tumor slide and look at it down the microscope and see whether there's a mismatch repair defect or not. It doesn't need any elegant and more elegant analysis than that, P53. Immunohistochemistry is the second one, and the third test is sequencing for the uh, polymerase epsilon gene. The so second tribute then, I, I consider myself one of the most blessed humans in, on the planet to be uh, fortunate enough to be involved with both of these teams who have made the biggest difference to endometrial cancer patients. So Transportec is uh, an international research consortium that was put together at the time of this study, PORTEX-3, these PORTEX, uh, the, the acronym refers to post-operative radiotherapy and endometrial carcinoma, and they, they first had, uh, in PORTEX-1 and 2, produced, um, uh, these were randomized controlled trials to look at the uh, importance of radiotherapy in different uh, risk groups of endometrial carcinoma. Portex 3 is when the group came together as Transportec, and we meet twice a year with um, everybody pulls in their research ideas. It's a very collegial group and a, a really inspiring collaboration to be involved with, just like the team here. So um, what this... Uh, group of trials, this one is ongoing, what this group of trials gave them was um, combined data on more than 1,200 molecularly classified patients who had received, uh, who had been recruited to randomized controlled trials and had received very standard treatment, very well, you know, predefined controlled treatment. So it was not like a population-based group. And it's a pleasure to work with Chaling Bose, um, who is a young pathologist from the Netherlands, who is the lead pathologist of this team. So what uh, Transportex showed was, first of all, the same as everybody else, that these four groups are prognostic. They, they, and and we'll, we'll, we'll look at the different uh, prognosis in a minute. Uh, but, but we already knew that. There were many, many series who had shown that. It's good to see that in a, in a group of clinical trial patients. But they showed one further thing that sent ripples through the um, gynae oncology teams worldwide a couple of years ago. And that was with the translational work related to PORTEC-3. PORTEC-3 was a trial in which it was um, tested whether chemotherapy 
improves the outcome of endometrial cancer patients versus radiotherapy alone. So high-risk patients were selected and they were divided randomly, one-to-one uh, -one randomization into either receiving only radiotherapy or radiotherapy with concurrent chemotherapy and followed by chemotherapy to see if there was a difference in outcome. And the results were that uh, were published in 2019 showed that Yes, indeed, chemotherapy did improve the survival of endometrial cancer patients, high-risk endometrial cancer patients, and this was maximum in stage three cases, as well as uh, serous morphology. So that, that was uh, gratifying. But the more important result came as part of the translational work. We, we, we then went back and looked at the molecular groups of those cases. We had their blocks and we could uh, see which molecular group they belong to because at the time of randomization, way back from 2006 to uh, 12 or 13, obviously there was no TCGA and they were uh, risk assessed on the basis of standard morphology and grading and stage. What the translational work showed was that this dramatic improvement in survival with chemotherapy was almost entirely restricted to women, uh, to cases that were P53 abnormal. And at the other end of the spectrum, if you look at the first group of poly mutation cases, chemotherapy offered no survival benefit whatsoever. They did just as well with radiotherapy as with the addition of chemotherapy, and they do so well anyway. Uh, with MMR defective patients, again, chemotherapy made no difference, and all we gave those patients was toxicity. And with the uh, last group, the no specific molecular profile, there was a trend to improved survival with chemotherapy, but not statistically significant. So this was really important, that this is not just that we can uh, improve prognostication and therefore risk prediction and make those decisions correctly, who needs and who doesn't need um, uh, adjuvant treatment. But on top of that, this also predicts the response to treatment, at least, at least to uh, conventional agents. And we also know, thanks to PROMISE, that this can be replicated in this classification can be replicated in routine uh, diagnostic practice with very simple tests. So where do we go from here? This is a paradigm shift, and we know what that means. It's impossible to get people to change their mind, and especially when the key players are pathologists. If you, if you know any pathologists, pathologists know everything. They, they, they can't be told anything because they know everything. And what's more, they've known it for 20 years and they know it better than anybody else. And you can see how much I have battle scars from previous um, attempts to change, uh, get people to change their practice. So that's, that's the big challenge. We have to change our way of thinking that these cancers belong to four groups, not two groups. We have to understand that this thing that we've been doing all this time, we look down the microscope and say whether a tumor is low-grade endometrioid or high-grade endometrioid or serous or clear cell or whatever, makes no odds because when you look at the four groups, there is a mixture of all different histotypes. And that mixture is probably the most dramatic in this group of cancers that has the worst outcomes. And what's more, this histotype variation is even more accentuated when we look at high-risk endometrial cancers, because when you pull out all of these low-risk, low-grade endometrioids, then those differences are even more. So we cannot do it by looking down the microscope. We have to change the way we think and think about these tumors as four different carcinomas that we cannot necessarily recognize down the microscope. The first of them, accounting for less than 10%, occurs in young women. This is not associated with the usual metabolic syndromes that we associate with endometrial carcinoma, uh, not associated with a hereditary susceptibility, generally low stage, but often show lymphovascular space invasion, which is what puts them at a high risk category. And to us, down the microscope, often high grade or often with ambiguous morphology that we can't tell is this endometrioid or serous. They often have bizarre giant cells that compounds that uh, diagnosis. They often have a lot of a lymphoid infiltrate. So here's second tribute. This, this uh, study, a, a meta-analysis led by 
uh, Jessica McAlpine. So another really awe-inspiring colleague who is doing so much and has done so much uh, to um, incorporate endometrial carcinoma molecular classification into routine practice. So this meta-analysis showed that of the 300 um, cases reported so far for whom uh, th they had data to, uh, who, who provided these 13 studies, who provided data for them to analyze, 300 patients, only 12 events, only three deaths. And um, it didn't seem to make a difference whether uh, treatment was given or not. It's true that these events do occur in high stage patients, but even in the absence of any adjuvant treatment, the incidence of these events is very low and they are salvageable. So these probably do not need any adjuvant treatment at all. The second group is of the mismatch of paired effective tumors, approximately one third, wide age range. Again, these are not the obese, uh, diabetic, uh, elderly people. Um, these can be hereditary in 10% as Lynch syndrome, greater likelihood of presenting at high stage with, with LBSI. And again, to us down the microscope, often high grade, often with a lot of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, frequently show mucinous differentiation, frequently show this odd pattern of invasion that can be mistake, missed or mistaken for um, vascular invasion and often show a lot of vascular invasion as well. And this is the group which will hugely benefit from um, being identified as an MMR, firstly, because within this sits the, uh, sit the Lynch syndrome patients, and here the implications are for prevention of a future cancer um, as well in, in the patient herself, as well as in, in their family. Um, it, of course, is uh, part of the molecular classification, therefore prognostic. It's useful for us for disease classification. And these tumors, as far as conventional treatment is concerned, show high radiation sensitivity. And as Portec 3 uh, showed, low chemo sensitivity. Uh, it's questionable whether they would respond uh, to hormonal therapy um, or, or to what extent that remains to be seen and they show good response to immune modulatory treatment. The third group accounting for half the, of all the cases, wide age range, and this is the group which is associated with hyperestrogenic states, rarely uh, hereditary, generally low stage, um, intermediate to excellent prognosis, a mixed group from which more molecular classes are likely to emerge, this is the group in which, uh, like MMR, histotype and grade appear to remain prognostically important. Chemoresponsiveness is, a, is questionable at the moment, needs to be tested with prospective trials. And this is the group most likely to benefit from hormonal treatment. And then lastly, around the just over the 10% mark, the P53 abnormal cancers. These are elderly, not associated with metabolic syndromes, around the 5% mark of being hereditary, BRCA-related, and potential for all the bad things, high stage, uh, likely to show peritoneal spread, even when they're not invasive. But on the good side, this is the group that benefits the most from chemotherapy. And this is the group for which there are a few uh, targeted treatments just in, in waiting in the wings to be, um, to be demonstrated to be beneficial. So PARP inhibitor treatment, trastuzumab, as well as at least in combination, immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment. So this is why the this is how the risk uh, categorization would look if we incorporate molecular classification. So for N MMRD and NSMP, quite similar to uh, what we do in the absence of molecular classification and then slightly different approach when we have the other two extremes of poly or P53. So what are we waiting for? This is something that seems to be the next best thing in sliced bread. What, what are the holdups? First is that, how much difference is this going to make in clinical practice? How well do we do when we don't know the molecular classification? So there are two possible uh, you know, changes, that there are many, many um, poly-mutated cancers that are hidden at the moment in these intermediate, high-intermediate and high-risk groups that would drift up to a low-risk group because uh, stage one to two uh, poly-cancers are recommended to have no adjuvant treatment. 
So that's one drift. And the other drift is in the other direction that there are potentially uh, cases in, in this molecular classification unknown group that we are classifying as low or intermediate or high that would move downwards to a higher risk group. High risk by definition, if there is myometrial invasion and just these uh, this minority of tumors with which are non-myoinvasive, which would still come to an intermediate category from a low category. So what is the magnitude of that drift? And this is uh, work from uh, Aileen again, who has done this retrospective analysis and demonstrated that the uh, drift magnitude of that drift is around the 10% mark. So it's not huge. 90% of the time without molecular classification, we're doing okay. We're putting the patients in the correct category. So of this 10%, 6 would go, 6% 6 would go to a lower group. These are the people who are being potentially overtreated at the moment, and 4% move to a higher group. These are the worryingly, uh, you know, it's a small minority, but we are potentially under -treated, treating them and they could benefit from adjuvant treatment. The second is that we don't have perspective data. Everything that we have up till now, the second barrier. Um, everything we have up till now is retrospective, and there are many, many trials going on in the world. This is the uh, rainbow trial in which the starting point will be an endometrial cancer of a particular risk category, and then the treatment options being assessed are completely different. So for P53 abnormal, it's chemoradiation, which chemo, um, Bordic 3 has shown to be effective with and without um, uh, PARP inhibitor treatment in MMRD. It is just radiation, no chemotherapy, but radiotherapy with and without immune modulatory therapy in NSMP, because there's still a question mark with chemotherapy. It's chemoradiation versus radiotherapy with hormonal therapy instead of chemo. And in polymutated, this is uh, being led um, by Jessica in, in Canada, where there is, it's a phase two trial where there is only um, no or de-escalated adjuvant treatment for that group. And the third thing now, this is the most important for the pathologist, is how to use these tests. We need to get used to that. Firstly, uh, the test interpretation for uh, P53 and MMR, that's, that's the major. It's also cost, but cost and access for poly. So now my personal journey, um, what we have done in the UK so far is to try and uh, standardize the way that P53 is reported. We started in 2016. I, I was fortunate enough to be the president of this British Association of Gynae Pathologists. So I was in a position to be able to implement things like this. So our first effort was to, uh, in collaboration with uh, UK Nexus and the CIQC, both external quality assurance schemes, to see how well people not only stain, but interpret their P53 stains. So we sent out um, uh, tissue slides from a tissue microarray from ovarian cancers to uh, 33 laboratories, and there were 98 uh, participating individuals who stained their slides and then sent in their interpretation. And we reviewed those centrally to look at both the quality of the stain and the interpretation and found basically that it was pretty good, but that was the start. The second thing, though, was to see, does P53 immunohistochemistry serve as a surrogate for a mutation in biopsies? That was uh, an unanswered question after the PROMISE studies, and also because endometrial cancer has a, a much more... Um, complex genomic landscape than, than ovarian cancer. Martin Koble had done this for ovarian cancer, but this was the next thing. And this showed that it is indeed an accurate surrogate. And the reason I put these three papers back to back is uh, twofold. Firstly, to show that there were other things that were needed to complete that jigsaw puzzle. One was that the uh, poly mutations needed to be defined. If we look at the TCGA, then under the MMR group, you will find loads and loads of poly mutations, which are of no clinical consequence. To get that really good clinical outcome, you need to have pathogenic poly mutations. And that was um, worked out in this comprehensive study uh, over uh, I'm sorry, I've managed to put the, the same paper twice, but there were two papers, one that um, brought up the uh, interpretation of somatic poly mutations. And the other thing that um, the uh, Alicia Challing and Blake were the key players in that, the other study was to define multiple classifiers because both MMR 
defect and poly defects can cause mutations in all sorts of other things, including P53. And that question was unanswered that if a poly mutant endometrial cancer then goes, or an MMRD endometrial cancer then goes on and acquires a P53 uh, mutation, does it then change its nature to turning into a nasty high risk case or not? So these three publications were simultaneously published. And here I'd like to acknowledge the uh, foresightedness and clear thinking of Blake Jilks, who's another um, awe-inspiring member of this team in Vancouver, because it was his, um, you know, particular brand of leadership, gentle coercion, that made sure that all of these papers were published in the January of 2020, in advance of the publication of WHO. Blake, Blake had a lot of uh, responsibilities in the WHO, and ironically, he was not uh, an author in this chapter, but I think it needs to be acknowledged that he has done a lot of the work in the background that uh, uh, is reflected in the content of this section of the book. So this is the algorithm that you've already seen before. Um, and the next thing then was my involvement in this uh, project, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence are the people who have to approve every new testing uh, that is incorporated in the National Health Service. Um, in England, and so this was a, a landmark as well in 2020 that uh, it was nice recommended that um, mismatch repair deficiency should be tested in every new diagnosis of endometrial carcinoma. And to prepare for that, we also put out a guidance document from the BAGP, our logo changed in those years, um, to to define the reporting terminology as well as guidelines for interpretation of mismatch repair immunohistochemistry and endometrial cancer so that we were ready by the time that that nice guidance came out. So the next thing after P53 and MMR, the next thing to tackle was poly testing. And uh, early last year, we put in uh, an application jointly from the British Gynae Cancer Society and the BAGP to ask for poly testing to be included. And our application was successful. And I think it was successful because we suggested an economical way of testing. We said that we didn't need to test everybody, but we needed to uh, do this uh, in, in people who had uh, ca cancers that had a mismatch repair defect or a P53 abnormality to start with, or they were high grade. Um, so the idea, in, in one sense, this seems like, why on earth did you have to do that? Uh, you know, WHO and the clinical guidelines have all recommended that you should, if you can't do it on, on every case, then do it for high risk cases. But the difference was, to insist on universal P53. Um, otherwise, that whole algorithm, I was trying to go back to the algorithm, this whole algorithm, if you say that I'll only start this off when I have a high risk case, then you have put at your first step a morphological assessment, and we already know that that doesn't work. So you need to replace that morphology or, or uh, supplement that morphology with an objective test. Any of us on a bad day can miss a, a serous carcinoma and sign it out as endometrioid, but if you do this up front, you're less likely to do that. So to do that in the first instance um, on a biopsy, so that every, um, bio, in, and in this case, the, the poly test essentially validates the P53 or the MMR. And then uh, if it is not done at that point, wait until you have all of the parameters and then only carry out poly testing where it influences management, uh, your adjuvant treatment de definition. Uh, uh, recommendation. So uh, Aileen has uh, looked at this algorithm retrospectively in the data that she has and shown that we would, the, the outcomes of this group whose poly status is unknown, whether we look at uh, recurrence-free survival or disease-specific or overall survival are, are very, very good. This is this brown um, survival curve sitting above the others, sitting above even poly. So they do very well, so it's safe. And um, uh, this has been submitted as a, as, a, as a paper, and this is a good point to acknowledge my, my newest uh, collaborator from this group, another awe-inspiring person who is helping me, Amy, is helping me to write clinical guidelines for the United Kingdom, which are very much um, based on this 
selective algorithm. And finally, this term ELECTRA. So this is a research project. The uh, ELECTRA is an acronym for expanding the laboratory diagnosis of endometrial carcinoma, targeted tested base, testing based on risk assessment. Essentially the same thing where we do the molecular testing only, um, that, well, it's going to compare whether we, it is safe to do the molecular testing only where it is recommended. So this is a perspective study. We, we received the grant uh, in March last year, then it went into a COVID tunnel. I've just received the ethical approval in February this year, and the statistics for this will be led by Aileen. And uh, this is a collaborative project between Bart's Health and UBC. And it is so simple that um, it's almost, you know, because what, what is missing in this whole algorithm is what is the number over here? Who is going to need poly testing and who isn't? How many patients will require um, this result? Uh, and um, uh, how many patients' treatments will oncologists change on the basis of this result? That's an unknown. Now, we could do this as just a questionnaire, but we opted to do it in, in uh, real time. So every one of those 600 patients who will be recruited in that study will be We'll be sending a questionnaire to the oncologist before we give them the result. The oncologist will face these three questionnaires. The first one will have everything except any molecular classification, and they will be asked to answer whether they will or will not give radi um, adjuvant treatment. If they opt yes, then we will ask them what they will give. On the next questionnaire, they'll be given the MMR and P53 immunohistochemistry and asked the same question. And finally, in the third questionnaire, they'll be asked, uh, given the poly testing in the final molecular category. And uh, it is hoped that over the two years uh, of recruitment, we, we will, of course, see a lot of variation between oncologists. And uh, this is the sort of study where the question will become outdated even before the study starts. It's already become outdated in the time that we've got ethical approval in that we do have poly testing available in the UK now uh, from next month. But the main objective, uh, the hidden agenda, is that we need to start getting used to this. We, we have to familiarize ourselves with what are the real time problems when we start doing this, all of this sort of stuff that we don't really get to grips with until we start doing it. That was the reason to ask for the fundings to allow us to, to test it out on six or 700 patients and to develop uh, a well annotated case cohort. That's, that's the main reason so that we have something from the UK that can be useful to validate other work. So my last slide, molecular classification can be delivered economically. Uh, if we do MMR immuno on every case, and there are all sorts of reasons to do that, but we also do P53 on every case, and poly testing only on selected cases where this will affect treatment. And this is certainly within reach for many of the high-income countries where this tumor is rampant. So my many thanks to everybody on this chart and everybody I named, and also many, many people who I could not name. Thank you.